Hello. Ah, I can sort of see people. That's amazing. Um, I'm going to share my a different screen though, and hopefully that. So, thank you very much for having me this morning to talk a bit about um, how to be a pirate in business. That was the title that I gave the talk this morning, and the reason why I did that was partly because I had a bit of a Twitter argument with someone about it last week, um, but it was also because. Um, it's something that I get asked about a lot. What does it mean to be a pirate? And I think we have begun to equate piracy with, in business at least, with disruption, rule breaking, innovation. Partly that's the responsibility of this guy, of Steve Jobs. That's who I usually get thrown out when I start talking about pirates, because of course he uttered this immortal line, I'd rather be a pirate than join the Navy. And so, you know, Apple has become somewhat synonymous with innovation and disruption in business. Um, but what I want to say and talk about this morning a little bit is a slightly different version of being a pirate um, that is less about the Silicon Valley move fast and break things entrepreneurial startup culture and is yeah goes goes a bit further because piracy isn't just about rule breaking and rebellion it's actually a lot more than that. And that's what I've learnt over the last couple of years from being immersed in our Be More Pirate community, um, a sort of growing movement of individuals and organisations all over the world that have uh, started to take kind of pirate principles and adopt them in business. So that's kind of what I'm going to talk about. But I'm going to start at the beginning because two and a half years ago, I really wasn't very pirate at all. Um, I didn't really know what it would what it meant to be pirate. I simply responded to a very interesting job advertisement for a right-hand pirate to this guy. This is Sam, my co-pirate and conspirator and colleague, looking very grumpy and he's not grumpy at all usually, he's actually very cheerful. And the job job advert really only had two lines to it. It was, I'm, I'm looking for someone to help me turn my book Be More Pirate into some kind of social impact and stop me from disappearing up my own ass. That was Sam's brief to whomever got the job. And I thought that sounded interesting and unusual. But I also came in with quite a big degree of skepticism about the concept. I took one look at the book, which is bright pink, and has this, what I would describe as a quite a clickbaity title, uh, subtitle of how to take on the world and win. And I didn't really believe that promise because I'd seen too many authors and change makers um, and leaders come in with this promise and not follow through on it. So I, you know, asked him quite directly and took him to task and said, is your book more style over substance? And he just said, you tell me. All he, all he knew was that he'd started receiving messages from people who'd read the book, um, people attaching their resignation notices, people describing how they were starting these mutinies inside their workplaces. And really, um, taking on board the pirate principles that he'd outlined in the book. And so, you know, he said, I, I don't quite know what's happening, but I feel like something is starting as a result of this and I need some help. And that sounded like a very interesting brief to me. Um, so I decided to take the job and become right hand pirate. I never in a million years, to be honest with you, imagined that it would there would be so much substance in it that we would end up writing a whole new book about it with all the stories and case studies of people who'd taken on board the ideas of being pirates. But that's that's what it came to. And I'm going to share some of that today. Um, and what I want to start with is the first thing that I learned from our community of our from our network. Um, the line that most resonated with people from the book was this one. No one is coming to save you. It's going to get worse before it gets better, which sounds really pessimistic. And, and this, this talk won't be pessimistic at all. But in, in that line, um, you know, it was people writing to us who, for whatever reason, had come up against a huge obstacle in their life where they'd seen the level of external stability crumble, whether it was losing a job or their company coming to the brink of financial collapse. They'd realised that actually, um, the external structures were quite fragile and that there was no grand plan. There was no one kind of backing this up. And in that space was something terrifying, but also very liberating. Um, a space opened up for them to start to take a bet on themselves, to start to trust themselves and take more responsibility in agency than they ever had done before. So that was the first interesting thing. Uh, the second thing about Be More Pirate and what it seemed to give to people 
was a story, a really powerful story about change. Um, you know, over the last, the, you know, the book came out um, in 2018, in the first couple of years after Brexit, when this feeling of uncertainty was starting to descend on, on us. And there was no, there is no unifying story for people to get behind. Um, you know, po politics was fragmenting. But pirates started to give people a sense of a story again, of something to get behind. Um, it was, you know, pirates is in many respects a bit of a David and Goliath story of pirates versus the Navy of ordinary people doing something quite extraordinary. And it gave people a new language to talk about change and a kind of cloak of disguise. This avatar of pirate was something that you could step into. So that was the second thing that was that was really, really powerful. Um, but of course, we do grow up with this uh, idea of pirates being the kind of cartoonish villains from Disney. Um, and so that does that does put, put a lot of people off of what pirates is about. So I'm constantly trying to bust that myth as well. Um, the truth of the original pirates um, is obviously a lot more nuanced than this. They weren't these kind of greedy, thieving villains, or at least they weren't just that. The truth probably looked a little bit more like this. Um, the, the story that, that unfolds in Sam's book is really takes on board a very small period of history known as the golden age of piracy, which was from about 1700 to 7, 1725, really like 25 years, but 25 years that did change the world. And at the time, the Royal Navy was the biggest employer in the UK or the British Empire. And the Britain was part of an empire and was out plundering the world. There was a slave trade. Um, and so, you know, most young men, uneducated young men, were harangued into signing up for the Navy and becoming a sailor. But life at sea was pretty brutal. 40% um, of sailors died on any voyage. And even if you did survive the voyage, you weren't guaranteed any pay at the end of it. So it was a, it was not a, uh, a nice existence. And it certainly wasn't something you really were volunteering to do, um, which changes the idea of why anyone would become a pirate in the first place. It was really about a bid for freedom and a chance to Im drastically improve your quality of life. So these original kind of golden age pirates were just sailors in the Navy who decided to take a punt and go off and form crews of their own and see if they could, you know, outrun the Navy and maybe steal some of their resources. But life at sea was still pretty awful for anyone. Um, you still had the same sort of rates of disease and um, battling the, the, the elements. So pirates had to figure out a way to live and work together in a dif differently um, so that they could survive and ideally, you know, take down the Navy. And that's where the story gets really, really interesting. So first up, pirates created a zero barrier to entry on their ships. Anyone could become part of a pirate crew. So they had some of the most diverse workplaces in the world. On the far right, you have a slightly sordid depiction of a female pirate. I think it's meant to be Anne Bonny, who is one of the most famous female pirates. Next to her is Black Caesar, uh, one of the many black pirate captains, originally a sa slave, then freed by pirates. Um, and then next to him is, of course, the infamous Blackbeard. And next to him is Black Sam Bellamy, um, Black was a very uh, key pirate name. <laughs> Black Sam Bellamy was also known as the Robin Hood of the Sea uh, or the Prince of Pirates. He was the richest and the youngest of pirates. Uh, youngest when I say he died uh, at age 28. So pirates had these incredibly diverse teams. They knew that, that you know, talent was the only thing that mattered. It didn't, it didn't matter where you came from, which was incredibly unusual at the time. Then the next step was that they gave everyone an equal say on all the decisions that were made on board pirate ships. So if you, um, you know, every, yeah, every decision um, got, everybody had an equal vote, everybody mattered. The only time that wasn't the case was when they were in battle when the captain had the final say. But they had checks and balances on power too. So the captain and the quartermaster shared the governance, um, which is the kind of system that we now see in parliament. This was originally pioneered by pirates. And it was to ensure that it couldn't be abused. So the quartermaster would be in charge of the crew or be the voice of the crew and be in charge of things like punishment and money, the two things most likely to be abused by a captain. Um, and that worked pretty well. They also gave everybody equal and transparent pay because that was the most likely thing to create conflict on board a ship. So everyone knew what everyone was getting and the captain would typically get only uh, two to four times more than the average crew member. 
They also pioneered one of the first, play, um, first forms of workplace in social insurance. So if you lost a leg an, or an eye in a battle on a pirate ship, you'd get compensated. You'd get monetary compensation for your trouble. And it was a way of protecting their bottom line, really. It was a way of ensuring that people were invested in the outcome and, um, you know, and kind of fought to full degree rather than, you know, trying to um, avoid the battle at all. Because in, an, in the Navy, you would have just been left for dead if you were injured. They were also um, incredibly kind of dynamic um, as, a, as an international criminal organisation, <laughs> pirates were much more collaborative than you'd give them credit for. They weren't all about kind of tearing each other down. They actually worked together. So if you want, they wanted to fight a big battle, they would team up with other pirate crews and then they'd scale right back down when it was over. But they'd always retain their autonomy and their independence um, so that there wasn't this kind of command and control structure that we see in most organisations still today. They were very self-organising and flat. And one of the ways in which they were able to kind of retain that level of autonomy, but still be part of like the pirate entity was through the Jolly Roger. You know, we think of the skull and crossbones as like, the, you know, a, a symbol of, of piracy, but they were actually very tailored and um, different crews would have different Jolly Rogers. But the most important thing about the skull and crossbones was that it was a way, again, to protect the bottom line of pirates. So they would raise the black and hope that people would that, that the opposing ship would surrender automatically and then they didn't have to get into battle at all so it was a way of protecting their resources they didn't really want to get into battle it was a complete waste of time money effort men power so they were always trying to avoid it which contradicts the typical idea of pirates as being the most violent out there i won't avoid that point entirely and when and, and I will say that when pirates were violent, they were really violent and they did resort to things like torture. It would be um, unfair to say not, but they did. In terms of frequency, they were probably the least violent people on the sea at the time. Um, and they did it really by dramatising their story and weaponising the story and making sure that people knew that they were coming and that they made themselves seem as scary as possible. And finally, the thing that always surprises people the most is that pirates even had a form of same-sex marriage. If you, um, if your partner died, um, you would even get their share of the inheritance. The legal and ritual ceremony they created for um, same-sex marriages was really sophisticated, um, which again shows how progressive pirates were. And it wasn't because they were more moral, I think, than anyone else. I think it was simply that they had to acknowledge, you know, the reality of what was happening um, and allow it to flourish. And that was the only way that their teams were going to work to maximum effectiveness. The point, of course, being that pirates were not the troublemakers that we think that they are. They were actually innovators, the first innovators, I'd say. And they, but, the, but crucially, they, they didn't innovate um, using, you know, sophisticated um, technology at the time. They innovated around human behaviour. And, and unfortunately, innovation has become too synonymous, I think, with technology, and which is why I railed against the Silicon Valley um, piracy um, stereotype at the beginning, because technology won't save us either. At least technology alone won't. We have to innovate around behaviour. Um, and that's what where pirates really led the way on that. And, and the, the core of that, the backbone of the pirate success was this idea of the pirate code. And that's something that has been um, core to the modern pirates that I've seen too. The pirate code was a way of establishing your the, the ways of working, um, the principles that matter to you, your identity and how you're going to make that real. It's like a living blueprint for culture. Um, in the original pirate codes, there was usually five to ten articles or rules that everybody adhered to, and it was what gave the team or crew transparency, trust and accountability, which is something that most, most organisations and businesses would say are top priorities in team culture. Um, however, what I've noticed is that when I've been working with teams, we're really, really good at creating shiny values or mission statements. Um, the rhetoric's usually there, but it doesn't always translate into reality. And so the pirate code is about closing the gap between your intention and your action. It's about translating those principles into behavior um, and making it real for people. And, that, and that's that's pretty challenging. And it was a quite but it was quite a big surprise to Sam and I when we, we started to get sent 
people's modern pirate codes. So there's lots of different examples I could give you of, of how companies have, have used the code. So I've just chosen one for now that I think is interesting, partly because this company does bear some resemblance to the kind of startup culture that I've been talking about. Uh, this company is Mr. and Mrs. Smith, the travel company, uh, travel club, who started off as really early stage sort of disruptors of the travel industry. They were creating quite a different model um, for selecting boutique hotels. And they started off as a self-described ragtag bunch of pirates who were really clear about their purpose, were very uh, accountable to each other. There's lots of trust, lots of, um, uh, you know, equality. They were they had a pretty flat structure, all of that. Um, but um, and yeah, and they sorry, they started like, again, sort of thinking about the, the pirate ideals of how they could weaponize their story and kind of get noticed and be these these up and coming pirates against the, the sort of Navy travel industry. They started off with these amazing um, campaign posters, started a guerrilla marketing campaign and it, and, it, and it worked. They were pretty successful. They expanded, um, started working globally. But over time, like every, um, well, is the risk run by every pirate that you, you sort of risk becoming like the Navy and you become too um, obsessed with growth and scale and you lose sight of who you were in the first place and what that original code was and to an extent this happened to Mr and Mrs Smiths they um, grew very rapidly and then a couple of years ago a incident happened um, within their team that made everybody stop and take stock one of their team um, took their own life and it just was an absolute bolt out of the blue that made them realize they needed to revisit their code to, to recognize who they were again and who they wanted to be, but not just to create a, a plan or a strategy, but to actually make it real. So that then their new code focused very much on on action and behavior. So they did things like introduce everybody um, having a, an individual coach to help them um, realize their ambitions and, and work on their, you know, their mental health and their um, different aspects of personal development. They introduced emotional intelligence into departmental training. So these are very concrete actions that were trying to close the gap between the intention and the action. Another example that where of a an organization, uh, sorry, a company that started with a code, which is important, I think, um, is Mercedes Benz, who you would not think of as being pirates at all. I appreciate that they are about as corporate as you get. <laughs> so it was a surprise, I think, to Sam that they were wanted to take on board Be More Pirate. And it was a one team, um, the Mercedes-Benz Vans team in the UK, who saw that there was an opportunity to change the culture and decided to run with it. Um, the automotive industry is changing rapidly anyway, so they were probably going to have to change anyway. So they created an entirely new marketing strategy Usually Mercedes would have, have kind of done their selling in a pretty conventional way. They would have stuck to TV ads and broadcast marketing billboards, that sort of thing. But instead, with this new strategy, they decided to focus on building relationships instead, specifically building relationships with SMEs and entrepreneurs across the UK. And the question they asked themselves was, how can we actually support the infrastructure of small businesses across the UK? If they make up half the economy, what can we do for them? And so they went out on the road and they started to meet and greet people and actually learn right from the horse's mouth. And this is this is usually, you know a real deviation in strategy, but they would the point was to focus not on mass broadcasts but on building critical connections instead. However, this was a risk for the team because they typically. Um, would get a much quicker return on investment through the kind of usual TV ads type um, marketing. This was going to be a longer term game, which it would have been had it not been for COVID. And now this is where I think the this, this story is really interesting because when COVID hit last March and suddenly every business was shutting down and small businesses were adversely affected, Mercedes were able to mobilize a Vans loan scheme almost overnight using the relationships that they built and get in touch with all the businesses that could pivot quickly to a delivery model and say, OK, we've got a, we've got a loan scheme up and running for you. And so actually it didn't um, 
It proved much more profitable much more quickly than they ever imagined. And I think, you know, when I talk to teams and I emphasize the importance of building relationships as your part of your strategy, it's often seen as the fluffy stuff. But it's actually what gives an organization so much more agility and so many more unexpected opportunities um, than if you stick to kind of conventional strategy because people are opportunity. So, but still bearing in mind that this, this was risky for Mercedes. This was very much unknown territory for them at the time, which speaks to another pirate principle of going off the edges of the map. And this is how I describe innovation really, that um, on old maps, there used to be this phrase here, there be dragons with an arrow pointing off, which is where the pirates went into the darkness. And this is a, a, a quote that I've nicked from the TV show, Black Sails. In the darkness, there is discovery, there is possibility and there is freedom. In that dark space that's unfamiliar, that's where you get the treasure, the, the new stuff. Um, but you have to be, in order to get there, you have to be willing to be uncomfortable because it's unfamiliar. You can't manage innovation. You can't get there without that sense of uncomfortability. And I, I know that that's, that's one of the biggest obstacles. When Sam and I started working with teams doing workshops, we noticed how difficult people found it to speak their mind and really voice the challenges that were going on underneath the surface in a team. But without having that level of honesty, you don't get to any real solutions. Um, and to back up our hunches, a couple of years ago, we decided to do a brief workplace survey, um, a very small sample of people, but a representative sample of the workforce in which we asked them some key questions. One of them was, have you ever sat in a meeting and verbally agreed to align around an idea whilst internally disagreeing completely? And 85% of people said, yes, at least once. I've done that. We then asked a follow-up question, which said, thinking about the previous question, did you then agree, but offer no practical support to the idea at all? Agree and offer some practical support to the idea, but not follow through or agree and offer practical support to the idea while silently sabotaging its chances of success. And then over half of those people said that they had done that with 10 percent agreeing to sabotage. Which tells you two things. People are saying yes when they mean no. And conformity is killing business. And so we started to think about how, what we could do to you know, to, to support people to become more comfortable asking uncomfortable questions and raising difficult topics in the workplace. Um, so we, we, we created that as a practice of being able to ask the difficult question, coming up with them, practicing them in a safe space. And practice is really the, the key thing here, because if you spontaneously ask difficult questions, uh, quite often you you don't know how it's going to come across. You become very, very um, kind of. Uh, uh, you can even become quite confrontational. It can, it can become quite confrontational or you can backtrack very easily um, because you feel you said something wrong. So sounding out with other people, practicing how to voice these sorts of things is really, really important. However, when I started to talk about the need to ask uncomfortable questions, um, I also wanted to do a bit of research and back it up with a bit more science and in doing so I came across a term called intelligent disobedience and this has been really fascinating to me to explore. It's a term that comes from guide dog training so when you train a guide dog you first train it to be obedient um, like you would train all puppies. It has to be able to listen to its human and take instruction. But critically, there's a period after that where you train it to be actively disobedient, or at least what that means is to be able to listen to its own judgment to make decisions because the puppy has a different vantage point, a better vantage point than the human. And that is true of of life and, and humans, too, that your colleague has likely a different vantage point and potentially a better one. So if you do not have a culture where you can voice those different points of view that that perhaps more uncomfortable challenging vantage point then you're ultimately going to get um not as good outcomes and and the, the book that i that i read to find about 
find out about this um, is called Intelligent Disobedience, and it's written by a behavioural scientist called Ira Shalef. And he goes into lot, uh, quite a few different examples from medicine, from the military, from high risk environments where it's so critical that the outcome is safe. And without challenge culture, you don't get that. So this is one of the reasons why it's really important to, to bring it in and to practice. But I think for me, you know, when I refer back to the, like the bigger picture of why I do this work and why I'm trying, why I care so much about Be More Pirate now, um, is that I think the business has such a big brief at the moment to lead the way um, ahead of government and ahead of the public sector to show how we, you know business can become not just sustainable because sustainable is the buzzword, but become truly regenerative to um, you know change up supply chains, look at the circular economy, and whenever I do work around this with teams, it almost always comes back to two fundamentals. Um, in order to make big changes, the kind of changes that the world needs, you've got to have courage and you've got to have imagination. And both of those things lie off the edges of the map for most people in that sort of dark space. Um, it's where, you know, in, in the edges, at the edges of the map is where you're going to find unexpected places, go to, you know, engage with unusual circumstances and people and, and expand your, your, your mental data set, let's say. And also, um, that's where you're going to find the courage because it's about sitting with the uncomfortability to an extent. The idea is that, you know, being a pirate is about going where others will boldly, um, where others fear to tread. But I also know and appreciate that that is um, difficult and that it's also very difficult to um, retain a focus on the bigger picture. The bigger picture of change can often feel very overwhelming. So what's also <clears throat> critical as a pirate is um, to keep it simple. Pirates did a lot with a little. They never really set out to change the world. <clears throat> they set out to change their world. They only wanted to make life better for themselves. They didn't set out to change the entire future of work, even if that incidentally sort of happened. So that's where you need to start. You just start with you and you just need to start. And that's where we, when we were going into doing workshops, we would um, stop talking about creating a grand plan or a grand strategy and simply focus on small, bold actions. Um, this was, yeah, the most critical point of action, finding something that is achievable, ideally within the next couple of weeks, but also makes you feel a little bit nervous if you carry it out. So you know that it's something that's going to be on the edge of real impact. Um, and a couple of examples I'll give you, because bearing in mind that everybody's tolerance for risk is different. You know, this is not, um, uh, you know, every, yeah, everybody has a different tolerance for it. So you have to figure out where you are. The team at Birdseye simply decided to drop meetings on a Monday. That was what felt manageable to them. And it felt what would make the biggest difference in terms of freeing up that mental time that they needed. One example from a workshop I did a couple of years ago was a woman who decided who worked in HR and was so fed up with seeing the word competitive on their job adverts because she felt that it was really unfair that people wouldn't know what they were getting when they applied. And so I said, couldn't you change that? Isn't that a small, bold action that you could do in the next couple of weeks? And all it would take was a slightly uncomfortable conversation with her manager, or she could just kind of go ahead and do it and not ask for permission. So they're all kind of identifying these, these small, bold actions. And we our rules for them are that they are simple. They stick within the nine to five. So they're part of your day to day working environment and that they feel a little bit scary. And the measures of success, for this kind of small, bold actions, professional rule breaking that we encourage in our in our work. Sam would always say that the measure of success is that you need to get fired once a year. I <laughs> find that in reality to be a bit too intimidating for people. Um, maybe feeling like you're going to get fired once a year might be more effective or better that someone else starts to follow the new rule that you've created, the new bold action that you've started, because that is what happened with the pirates. It just attracts enough critical mass that 
you start to see a swell and eventually your new rule infiltrates the mainstream. That's how change happens from the edges. But the final thing that I want to say, because I'm aware that I'm going to go over time, is that in everything that I've learned from Be More Pirate, it, it is largely a shift in mindset. Um, in carrying out a small, bold action, it's not so much that the thing that you do or you decide on achieves exactly what you set out to achieve. It might fail. But in making the decision and following it through, something happens to you in that process because you are taking a chance on yourself. And that is the biggest shift of all. Um, of all the rules to break and all the rebellions to start, the inner rebellion is ultimately the first and the hardest to do. Letting go of the old norms that you're holding within yourself and giving yourself permission to do things differently. Um, that is where it starts. So thank you very much.